jail is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on in God Tell. For those of you that don't know me, that's good. Am I right, Dwight? I'm the king of the hill with, with, I, with a queen that I follow around. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. The title of tonight's message is Reconciliation. I know how to say it, but I don't know how to spell it. Starting in verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearances and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all are dead. And that he died for all, and that he which we which or they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth we know him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and God has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now God evidently wanted us to know what reconciliation was because he mentioned either the word reconciliation or reconciled about six times in about four verses. Now it's true that most people have to hear something about six times before they remember it. Unless of course you're old, then it's 20 times. Or if you're a woman, it's 30 times. I should have got a bigger laugh right there. You know, I used to work in nightclubs and I could just look out at people and get them to laugh. And I come here and you people just look at me like I'm dead. Some of you aren't paying attention so you won't know anyway what's going on. But that's all right. Let's go back to verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, Jude verse 23, Jude only has one chapter but it does have 25 verses. Starting in verse 22, and of some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. <clears throat> Supposed to be telling people about Jesus so they can get saved. That's the whole purpose of us being here. 
And we are made manifest to God. In other words, God knows our lives. So we're persuading men. Now, we're not trying to talk people into being Christians. Because if you talk somebody into it, somebody else can talk them out of it. But we lay out forcefully, as forcefully as we can, all the viable, important facts. And then what you do to it or do with it is up to you. <clears throat> I trust also we are made manifest in your conscience is Hebrews 10.31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. The terror of the Lord. And earlier in the book of Hebrews, he tells us that our God is a consuming fire. God is a God of love, but the other side of that coin is that God is a God of wrath and judgment. God loves you and he wants you to see the side of the coin where his love shines. But if you won't obey him, you get the other side of the coin and get to go to door number two. Y'all have figured that out by now. Door number one is heaven. Door number two is that other place that we don't like to talk about. Hell. And you might go there. I guarantee you don't want to go there. For we commend not ourselves again to you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that you may have somewhat to answer them that glory in appearances and not in heart. Those who take great comfort in being politically correct, those who believe lies rather than the truth, because the truth is not convenient. There was a man in the Old Testament, his name was Jacob. Jacob had 12 boys. Benjamin was the youngest, Joseph was the one right before him, and then there was 10 more that were all older. One day, the 10 boys were out herding the sheep. Benjamin had to stay at home because he was too young, and Joseph really wasn't old enough to go tend sheep, but he was old enough to go to McDonald's and pick up a bunch of Big Macs to take to his brothers for lunch. And so his daddy called him in, said, son, I want you to go down there and feed get some burgers and feed your brothers lunch. And so he said, right, Pop, I'll go and do, I'll do it. And he went, had his coat on of many colors that his dad had made for him. And those brothers didn't like him much. They were very jealous of Joseph, kind of like Cain and Abel, you know. Cain wouldn't do what he was supposed to do. Abel did, and God was happy with him, so Cain killed him. That's what you do, you get rid of the competition. Well, Daddy loved Joseph more than all the rest of them. And they decided that they wanted to do something about it. So when Joseph finally caught up with them, they wanted to kill him. Reuben, the oldest, didn't want to kill him because he was supposed to be more responsible than the rest of them. And he didn't know what they were going to do. So they stuck him in a pit to hold him there until they figured out what to do. And then Reuben went off to take care of some business, probably at Bank of America. And um, an Ishmaelitish caravan came by on its way to Egypt. They were slave traders. And I think, I can't remember for sure, but I think it was Simon said, because Simon always says. That should have got a bigger laugh too. Simon said, let's sell him. Why should we kill him? We don't make any money by killing him. Let's sell him. And so they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites who were on their way to Egypt. And they took his coat of many colors off of him and they dipped it in blood. And then they went home and they said to Pop, is this your son's coat? Now they never told him that Joseph was dead. Is this your son's coat? He said, yes, that's my son's coat. And when he saw the blood, he assumed that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. Was Joseph killed by a wild animal? No, no. Boy, that silence is killing me. No, he wasn't. He was on his way to Egypt as a slave. But they didn't tell daddy that. They let him believe that his son was dead. And they tried to comfort him because he started uh, grieving immediately. And they tried to comfort him, but... He wouldn't be comforted. And he said, I will go to my grave mourning for my son. He mourned for 20 years. 
During all that time, Joseph was not dead. First, he was dropped off and sold to Potiphar, and he stayed at Potiphar's house actually doing all the work, the book work, and taking care of the money and everything for Potiphar until Potiphar's wife lied on him, said he made advances toward me. He didn't. So Potiphar believed his wife, believed another lie, in order to put Joseph in prison because he couldn't take Joseph's word over his wife's word, even though his wife was a dirty, rotten liar, and he knew it. But he had to save face somehow. Well, Joseph gets in prison. But it isn't too long till God's got Joseph running the prison. And I've always said, if you're going to be in prison, best thing to be is the head guy. Run the place. Well, Pharaoh had a dream. And he sent two of his trusted men to prison because he didn't like them anymore because they did something wrong. And he sent them down there. One was a baker and the other was a cupbearer. And uh, uh, Pharaoh had this, well, they had dreams first. And Joseph told them what was going to happen to them. One of them was going to be killed. The other one would be released. And the one was released and sent to, back to Pharaoh. And two years later, Pharaoh has a dream, a vision of what's going to happen in Egypt. And he doesn't know what it means. And he calls all the magicians and soothsayers and the astrologers and all these people in. And they couldn't interpret their, the dream. And then the cupbearer says, Oh, it's me, Lord. My shame. My bad. My bad. There's a man down in the prison that can interpret dreams. And so Pharaoh calls Joseph up and they bring him out and they give him a bath and a new cigar and a suit. Bring him into Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, you know, I asked all these guys to interpret my dream. They can't interpret the dream. And he says, I've heard you can interpret the dream. And Joseph says, you mean those guys can't interpret the dream? He says, don't you know that dreams and visions belong to God? And so he interpreted the dream. And the dream was that there was going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And so Joseph said, what you need to do is you need to build storehouses and you need to put up grain away. You need to save things so you can have the seven years of famine taken care of. And Joseph says, you need to put somebody that's really smart over this business to take care of it. And Pharaoh says, where are we going to find such a man? And Joseph's just standing there not saying anything. Pharaoh said, I choose you. There's nobody as smart as you. Joseph didn't think he was all that smart. He was just doing what God told him to do. Anyway, Joseph ends up being second in command in Egypt over the whole country. Can you imagine that? Well, finally, the famine hits. The land of Canaan is devastated. They can't feed their cattle. They come to Egypt. Two, the brothers come to Egypt, first of all, and they didn't recognize Joseph the second time. They did the, uh, the first time, but the second time they did, and uh, they went back and told daddy, he said, Joseph is still alive. And his dad would not believe it. You know why? Because for 20 years he had been believing a lie. And he was comfortable believing the lie. There are people in the school systems right now that are lying to our kids about where they came from, telling them they evolved from apes or some kind of precursor to an ape. It's a lie. It's all a lie. There's no evidence for it at all. It's just they're in control of the school system. They're lying and people want to believe the lie because they don't want to be responsible to God. Because if there is a God, then you are responsible to him. And if you don't obey him, you're going to find yourself in hell for eternity. Well, we don't want to think about that, so I must have come from an ape. Some of you act like you came from monkeys. But it's not true. Never has been true. And there are evolutionists out there that know and write books about it. It's not true. And they're trying to find another answer because they're atheists and they don't believe there's a God. So they don't want to believe in special creation either. But they know evolution's not, not true. But they're believing lies and they're comfortable believing those lies. Personally, I think I ought to believe that Mickey Mouse was the first president of the United States. 
And if I could tell myself that enough, I'd probably believe it. Besides, I saw a cartoon one time and he was president. <laughs> Must be true, Hollywood don't lie. So Jacob believed a lie and that's where people are today. We've got churches, unfortunately, full of people that are not saved because they believe lies and because their people in, the, in authority have talked them into and we end up with illegitimate children and they bear no fruit. If there was as many real Christians as there were church members, we'd turn this country upside down. But we're not doing it, are we? In fact, most church people just think that you need to leave everything alone. And now even uh, the conservative conventions that were never uh, going to sway in their opinion are now deciding to debate whether it's all right for men to marry men and women to marry women. And those people are believing lies. It's an abomination to God. But of course, before you condemn them, you better remember that all sin is an abomination to God. Murdering babies, it's an abomination to God. And we're going to answer for it. People say, oh no, not me. I'll, I'll never see that happen. Yes, you will. And you're going to say, you know, that Brother June wasn't as dumb as he looked. Some of you are going, uh-huh, uh-huh. And some of you, I know what you're thinking, and you better keep it to yourselves. For whether we are beside ourselves, you think we're crazy? It is to God. Do you know what it means to be beside yourself? That means there's two of you. In some cases, one's lost and the other one's out looking for it. Whether we be sober, it's for your cause or case. It's because of you. For the love of God constrains us because we judge that if one died, then all are dead. It's a hard principle for people to understand. <clears throat> there are a lot of people that call themselves preachers, but there's not very many that are actually called of God to preach. I have met many people that were preachers that ended up getting out of the ministry because it wasn't their life. It wasn't what God called them to do. Preachers that are called of God preach not because they want to, but because they don't have a choice. I don't have a choice. Otherwise, I would have quit 50 years ago before I got started, especially if I knew I was going to have to look at your faces. Because some of you look real mean. And some of you look like you're asleep. <clears throat> so we preach because Christ commanded us to. And if one died, Christ died, then we're all dead, and that means dead unto sin. You can always tell the fruit of a person because if they're sinning, it's obvious that they're not dead unto sin. Whatever that is in your life. Whatever is not of God's will in your life is sin because it's not of faith. He died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. In the book of Luke, it says, Jesus is saying, follow me. You want to follow me? Then you've got to pick up your cross. You've got to deny yourself daily, which it doesn't say in Matthew, but it does say in the book of Luke. Every day, deny yourself and follow me. That means you've got to say no to self. Self is the problem. We are the sinners. It's not somebody else we're talking about. We're talking about each one of us individually. We are sinners. We have to learn to say no to self, what the flesh wants. What your flesh wants and what you need is most likely two different things. God doesn't give you what you want. The TV preachers will guarantee you can have what you want, so go join that bunch. But it's a lie. God will give you what you need. And obviously, from my point of view, I'm looking out here at you people, and I know that God needs for you to be here. That's your need. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. You'd be somewhere else. 
preferably in a high dollar house with maid service. Right? Somebody to even turn, push the button on the remote for you because you're too lazy. Darn, I miss those days when our children were the remote. I don't know if you all remember those days when Nancy and I would sit on the couch watching TV and we'd want to channel change or something. Hey, Michael, Joshua, Jeremiah, Josiah. We, we left the girls alone mostly. Go change the channel for us. Hey, you need to change the vertical hole just a little bit. There's pictures rolling. <laughs> Those were neat days. Now we got buttons. And I hate them. You know why? Because I'm constantly pushing the wrong button. I try to push the pause button, and I push the off button. I try to to fast forward it just a little bit, and I hit one of those buttons that makes it jump a whole bunch of scenes, and I have to back up and try to figure out where I was. I hate remotes. I liked having the children do it. They were good at it. But we have to die to self. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. That means the law. Though we have known Christ after the flesh or the law, in other words, the law is what brought us to Christ. The law was, according to the word of God, our schoolmaster. It taught us the things we needed to know so we could come to Christ. And folks, you need to understand this. We're all born pretty much knowing the difference between right and wrong. I've watched little children. They, they, they know that they shouldn't take things that don't belong to them. They do it. But they're sneaky about it. You ever watched a child? They're sneaky. I always liked watching Bill Cosby. I still like watching Bill Cosby. I have to watch the old stuff, though. But he had some very interesting routines that he did. One of them was he told his, his son, he said, don't touch my Coke. He says, what did I say? Don't touch the Coke. That's right, don't touch the Coke. What did I say? You said don't for touching the Coke. Don't touch the Coke. That's right, don't touch the Coke. As soon as he turned his back, what did his kid do? Picked it up and took a drink from it. <laughs> I love that. The law brought us to Christ. The law gave us information that led us to Christ. The first four commandments are all about your loving love for God. The last six are all about your relationship to man. But we don't seem to pay too much attention to it. We're too busy doing what we want. So now we don't worry about law because we come to Christ by grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Whosoever shall do the will of the Father. What's the will of the Father? In the book of Hebrews it tells you the will of God is that everyone should come to repentance and that nobody perish. That is God's will. Is it going to be fulfilled? No. Because Jesus said the way that leads to destruction and door number two is broad and many will find it. The path that leads to righteousness is small and door number one and it's very narrow and few people are going to find it. Now, if you're one of those people that's a Christian and saved and you know you're on your way to heaven, not because you're smart, but because God says, trust me, you ought to be feeling really bad for the others that are going to hell. I don't like it. I don't want anybody to go to hell. But some of you in this room are going to end up going. And once that day happens and you pass that threshold into the judgment of God, I hope I'm there to say, I told you so. Oh, Brother June, you wouldn't do that, would you? Yes, I would. And Jesus will be there too, and he'll say what he said. It's not a game, folks. You have this life. That's all you have. Once you're dead, you have no more choices to make. 
You got to make them now. And they've got to be real. They can't just be words because God knows he judges your heart. And I'm glad he judges my heart. That's the new nature we're talking about rather than the old self and the old me because I'm a sinner. But from God's perspective, I stand perfect, complete and whole. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's what? A new what? Are you afraid to say that word? A new creature, a new creation. Brand new. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is why I believe that a lot of preachers are believing a lie. You read books. I do. I read hundreds and hundreds of books. And I've read hundreds of books. And uh, some by very famous preachers and scientists who are Christians. And they all say basically the same thing. That all of mankind is created in the image and likeness of God. But it's a lie. Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. God picked up some dirt and formed a man, blew into his nostrils a breath of life. He became a living soul. He was created in the image and likeness of God. We weren't made that way. We were birthed. We're clones. And you go to Genesis chapter 5 and it says Seth was born after the image and likeness of Adam, not God. And then if you read the genealogies, you'll find out that all of the men that are listed as the first, as the born of that particular person wasn't necessarily the firstborn, but it was the one that was birthed in the image and likeness of their father. And that's all the way through. But here's the neat part. John chapter 1 verse 12. As many as received him to them gave you power or authority to become the sons of God. So obviously you weren't the son of God until you what? Became the son of God, right? John chapter three and verse three. Jesus was talking to old Nick, Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, if you were created in the image and likeness of God, why would you need to be born again? We're not talking about something very complicated. And yet, I asked my wife the other day, you know, she's been right along there with me for 47 years, going to listen to preaching and reading books and everything. I said, have you ever heard anybody tell it like it is besides me? She said, no. And I'm wondering why these guys can't see it. Well, I know why. Because they're comfortable believing the lie that they've been told and it's been passed down from one generation to another generation. Fortunately, it doesn't really have anything to do with salvation. But it is important that we know who we really are. Without Christ in your life, you are spiritually dead. That's why you need to be born again so you can become spiritually alive then you become a child of God. Then you are created in the image and likeness of God because you are now a triune being once again as God created man in the first place. It's important that we know that. It's not, you get, people get so comfortable they think, well, I'm gonna to go to heaven because I'm one of God's children. I'm automatically gonna to go to heaven because I'm created in the image and likeness of God. But if you're lost, you're not created in the image and likeness of God, you're birthed and you look like your folks. And some of you say, well, I didn't have any parents. I didn't have much of one. My mother left when I was nine. My dad was not much of a dad, but it, you know, I know he loved me, but he was pretty much devastated after my, after my mother left. He was never the same again. You know, I can only remember in all the years of growing up till I left home, my dad doing something with me once or twice in all that time. He took me fishing once off the pier down at California near Huntington somewhere, Huntington Beach. And uh, we didn't catch anything. Then we went home. That was the end of that. He never went out in the yard to play catch with us anymore. He used to when my mother was there. He used to take us places all the time. He never took us anywhere. 
never did anything with us. I mean, to his credit, he kept working. He kept a roof over our head, clothes on our back, and food in our stomachs. But kids need more than that. And that's why I grew up in trouble all the time, because I was trying to raise myself. And one thing I can tell you about kids, they don't do a good job of raising themselves. They start ending up looking for parental figures in other people. And then they start hanging out with the wrong boys and girls who promise them the moon and end up getting them in jail. <laughs> I thought you were going to give me the moon. Well, look at the roof of the ceiling and imagine, you know. If you are in Christ, if any man, woman be in Christ, they are new. New. Not the same old person. That's why I don't go to the jails too much anymore. I don't go at all anymore. I used to go, but people had what we call jailhouse religion. Everybody wanted to get saved while they're in jail because they thought it would help them get out. And they'd say all the words, and they were the right words. But then two weeks, a month after they get out of jail, they're right back doing the same thing they were doing before. <clears throat> all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation to go out and bring other people to Christ. It's a contract between two, between us and God. And the contract is based on a promise. God promised us that he would get us to heaven if we would trust him. He didn't say if we'd do better because he knew we couldn't make it. Trust him. To it that God was in Christ. Where was God? In Christ. Reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses or sins unto them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Isaiah 43, 25. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even, I am, that's God's name, by the way, Exodus chapter 3. He that blotteth out thy transgressions or sins, for my own sake. God doesn't even forgive your sin for your sake. He forgives them for his sake because he's the one that made the promise. Listen to this. And will not remember your sins. Now, when we get to heaven, those of us that are going, there's going to be a lot of books. The Book of Life is one. That's the first thing God will do is look for your name in there. And then there's other books that describe all the things we've done. And the page that has the sin at the top, if you're forgiven like you're supposed to be, will be blank. Now, if you don't ask for forgiveness, you can still get into heaven, but the sins that you haven't asked for forgiveness for, they'll be listed there. And you'll see the opportunities you've missed and the things you should have done for God that you didn't do or the things that you did that you weren't supposed to do, they'll all be there. And the reason that's important is God says, if you regard sin in your heart, he uses the word iniquity. If you regard or hang on, cling to sin in your heart, in your mind, God will not listen to your prayers. Now I'm gonna tell you how serious this is. Let's say for instance, and I know some of you already believe this, that smoking is not God's will for your life. And yet you do it. And you can go to heaven. God doesn't send you to hell because you smoked a cigarette. But if it's not his will for your life, then it's not a faith. And whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So if it is not a faith and it's sin, then how many of your prayers are God going to listen to? None. He will not pay you any attention. And things will happen in your life and you'll think God answered your prayer, but some things just happen. But if you want God to answer your prayers, you've got to let go of sin. You've got to at least identify it and call it what it is. And you say, what it is. You've got to be honest. And you know it's foolish to try to hide from God because he sees it all. God cannot be fooled. 
And yet I've met people that are trying to hide things from God. You can't hide anything from God. He knows. He's a lot smarter than we are. Although there are many people in the world today that won't admit that. And that has become their sin. They think they're as smart as God. And that's what's wrong with the devil. He thinks he's as smart as God. He wants to be God. He wants to overthrow God. And he is very smart. He's smarter than us. But he's not smarter than God. And he is going to end up in a lake of fire. And there's nothing he can do about it. His biggest hope is that he can generate enough army on earth to overthrow God. That's what he's trying to do now. That's why there's all these different religions, in case you didn't know. They're following the devil don't even know it. He's that smart. He lets them think they're following God. And one day he's going to actually stand in the temple in Jerusalem and declare himself to be God. And the world's going to go after him. I know that because the Bible tells me. <clears throat> we are ambassadors. Why? Because God was in Christ reconciling the world and not imputing our sin, not putting it on our account. So he made us ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We beg you. We pray you. In Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Ephesians chapter, chapter 6, verse 20, says that we are ambassadors in bonds. We are chained to Christ. We can't do anything else. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He was holy, harmless, sinless, separate from sinners, and yet... He carried all the sin of all mankind on his shoulders to the cross. I heard a preacher say this one time, and it's true, but if you can visualize Christ on the cross, you ought to see your face there. You and I deserve to die on that cross, not him. I'm glad he did it for me, and I don't have to do it. I wouldn't have done it very gracefully like he did. I'd be cussing everybody. Get me off this cross and I'll show you what for. Christ didn't. He went to the slaughter like a lamb. Patiently took it. And never once yelled back an obscenity. Never once told them, I'll get even with you. And he could. He could have wiped them all out with a word. But he didn't do it. Because he knew he had to pay the penalty for our sin. Otherwise, there'd be no way for us to get into heaven. Of course, he could see the resurrection. We're going to celebrate that again next Sunday. He could see. And that brought great joy to him. Because he knew that death couldn't hold him. But the pain and the suffering he went through to get there was real. And all that pain, all that suffering, we deserved it. We're the ones that put him on the cross. Our sin. He knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That means as though we had never sinned. Justified. Just as though I'd never sinned. I'm glad that God looks at us through his special glasses of Jesus and doesn't see us. Otherwise, he'd have to destroy the world and start over. But he chose, because he loves us, he chose not to overlook sin, but to punish sin by taking the punishment himself. He doesn't overlook sin. Sin always has a price tag. The wages of sin is what? Death. Somebody had to die. So God was in Christ and he did it himself. There was no other. Perfect sacrifice. 
Our Father, we thank you for loving us, and we do thank you for each one in the room tonight. And we hope that they're listening. We hope that they understand that if they want to get into heaven, they're going to have to talk to Jesus. They're going to have to trust him. They're going to have to ask him. And they're going to have to be willing to admit their sin, starting with the sin of unbelief. They're going to have to name things. They don't need to tell me or any other preacher on earth, but they do need to tell you. And the neat thing is that you already know. We thank you for loving us in spite of ourselves. And we're grateful, Father, that you told us in James 1 that if we ask for wisdom, you'd give it to us. So we ask for wisdom. I ask for wisdom for me and for each person in here. Because with wisdom, we can make right decisions, right choices. Bless the remainder of this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.